Hi, my name is Andy Wu. I'm a principal consultant at Magenic, and I specialize in helping companies adopt and build cloud solutions. Over the past several months, I have been working with the team members from Google's cloud platform on a series of white papers describing how architects and developers can go about taking a legacy ASP Dyna app, a web form app no less, and modernizing it into a fully cloud native application. Details of this white paper series can be found in the URL listed below. One of the key topics discussed in the papers was containerizations and orchestration, a hot topic in today's IT landscape for sure. In particular, the papers discuss at length how containerizations and orchestration technologies and platform such as Kubernetes deal with scaling in order to handle high system load. Since this is a, such a topic of great interest to many, we thought it would be helpful to show it in action with a video. So, in this video, we are going to highlight the true power of Kubernetes in terms of its unique scaling capabilities. Of course, right from the beginning, Kubernetes has great scaling capability in terms of upsizing the number of parts when the load gets high. And this feature is called Horizontal Part Autoscaling, or HPA, where Kubernetes will scale out the number of parts within a cluster based on the observed CPU utilization. And that's all nice and everything, but if we review what a typical Kubernetes cluster looks like, such as this diagram, we can see a Kubernetes cluster is made up of one single master and a fixed number of nodes. And the keyword here is fixed number of nodes, which is translate into finite amount of computing resource for Kubernetes to utilize for pod-based scaling. Well, given this architecture, we should be asking the question, what happens if the configured numbers of nodes is maxed out in terms of its ability to provision pods, right? I mean, with a fixed number of nodes, there's an obvious upper limit to the number of pods that can be provisioned. Well, fortunately for us, GCP has implemented another scaling feature that will go hand in hand with HPA to overcome this bottleneck. And it's called Cluster Autoscaler. As its name implies, it is responsible for automatically adding node or nodes to a Kubernetes cluster when the load demand has exceeded its current size for no pool. And we will demonstrate how this feature can be implemented in GCP. As a prerequisite though, I will assume the audience already have some basic understanding of Kubernetes and its architecture. We will start by provision a brand new Kubernetes cluster is using Google Cloud Platform CLI, gCloud. Then I will create a deployment using a .NET Core image that has a dead simple c -sharp function that is designed to generate high CPU utilization. And this is what the code looks like. By the way, all the code artifacts used in this video will be posted on the GitHub repo listed below, so you can review it at your leisure. After that, we'll utilize another pre-existing part to hit the first part repeated, repeatedly in order to kick up its system load. During all this, we will observe how GCP's implementation of Kubernetes HPA and Cluster Autoscaler works hand in hand in order to handle the scaling up and down of resources. All right, let's get started. First thing we're gonna to have to do is to create a Kubernetes cluster by issuing this command, the gcloud command. And I wanna point out a couple of things about this command. First is a beta. Um, this is still um, a beta feature as of the time of this recording. And then the other thing is to make sure that you issue this uh, parameter, enable auto scaling, as this is the parameter that would enable uh, the auto uh, cluster auto scaler feature to work. And we issue this command, and it's going to take a few minutes for it to create the cluster. All right, the cluster is created. 
and we can verify that by going to the uh, portal and see that uh, indeed the uh, cluster is created along with another cluster that I've created previously that we will use later on. Now we need to connect to this cluster from our command prompt. Easiest way to do that is to click the connect button. That will give us um, the gcal command that we can use to connect to this cluster. We copy that guy, paste it here, issue it, and we'll connect it. Now that we have created a cluster, the next thing we have to do is to create a deployment using the kubectl run command that will use an image that contains the C-sharp function I have shown earlier. Next, we have to create a service of type load balancer to have the parts to be externally accessible. And finally, we have to create the horizontal parts autoscaling by issuing this command. Note the parameter of the CPU dash percent equal 50. This would tell Kubernetes that we want to keep the observed CPU level to be around 50%. If not, then it should create more parts to handle the, the load in order to keep the threshold around 50%. And we can do a quick check on the CPU level. And as you can see, there is 0% as there's nothing is hitting our parts. Next, we want to know the address, the load balancer address that was assigned. And we can do that by using the get service command. And we can see that the assigned IP address is this. And we can do a quick test. As you can see, the, the calc function is called by going to this route. As I mentioned in the overview, we will simulate the load generation by using another part cluster so that we have a clean separation between the code load generations and the load consumption. So now we do that by switching to the other cluster I have created prior to this recording. and copying this command. Well, actually, we need to run this in a separate um, uh, VM in the cloud. Otherwise, Kube, uh, CTO will get very confused about um, which cluster that it is going against. So let's do that. And in this cluster, we'll just create a very simple cluster. We will just create a very simple pod using the busybox image and call it load generator. And we'll just have it hit the my, uh, our low consumption cluster. And as you can see, it's calling the function. Okay, now that we have all the background set up out of the way, the fun parts begin. Let's do a quick check on how our parts are doing. And as you can see, our load generator is kicking up a quite a low storm on our part. And if we do a quick check on part, 
we see that it already Kubernetes already trying to uh, spread the load by spinning up three additional pods. And if we do a check on the number of nodes, and it remains at two. And this is the number we specify uh, in our initial cluster creation command, which had a minimum nodes of two. So after four parts are created, you can kind of see the um, CPU are starting to go down a little bit, um, as expected. However, it's still wait about the 50% uh, threshold that we specify. Well, since the CPU uh, utilization is higher than uh, threshold, one would expect Kubernetes to continue to spin up more parts to handle the load. And as you can see, it has doubled again to eight replicas or eight parts. Um, and we can certainly verify that by doing a CTO get parts. And there are eight. <clears throat> and let's see how many nodes we have at this point. Aha. So you can see since we are spinning up more parts and um, with the two nodes that was the initial size of our cluster, uh, the cluster autoscaler has kicked in and started to spin up more uh, cluster nodes to handle the parts uh, creation. That's all fine and dandy, but at 133, it's still above what we specified of the 50% threshold. So one would expect in a few minutes, Kubernetes will try to once again double the number of parts uh, in order to lower the CPU. So there it is. It doubled again to 16. And if we go to the dashboard, uh, the Kubernetes user uh, interface, uh, you can see the error messages that it has insufficient CPU uh, showing that the number of nodes that it's allocated at this point is not enough to um, fit the demand uh, of uh, the additional parts that it's trying to create. And so let's do a quick check on the number of nodes that's currently available. <clears throat> Aha! So it actually went ahead and um, created an additional node um, that will pretty soon kick in and let Kubernetes uh, fulfill the needs to create the additional parts. With the additional cluster node being created, we can go back to the dashboard and we can see all the parts of 16 of them are created successfully um, and is running. And if we go back to our um, console and do a get HPA to do a quick check on where we're at as far as the CPU, we can see we're getting very close to the target uh, we specify, which is at 50%. Well, with 16 parts, it wasn't enough to get to the threshold of what we're looking for, which is 50%. So Kubernetes is smart enough to add two more to the pod. And after a while, hopefully that will meet um, uh, the threshold that we specify. And there you have it. With 18 pods, um, it was able to get below what our threshold. And at this point, I think we can end our demo. <clears throat> and we can do it and stop our load generator first. And with the load being stopped, Kubernetes is going to be smart enough and stop um, killing off pods um, as they are not needed anymore. And at some point, it would uh, spin down the nodes as well to save resources. So this is great um, for resource saving, cost saving, um, as uh, Kubernetes is really helping you um, to right size the number of resource, both in terms of parts and nodes, in, um, in terms of dynamically meeting the load. 
And there you have it. We are down back down to one again, uh, given that there is nothing hitting our pots. And Kubernetes has done the right thing in terms of shutting the number of pots down. So this will conclude our demo. I hope it was educational and informative. Until next time, see you. Bye-bye.